The scripture reading for today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the 13th chapter, where we hear Jesus telling the parable of the weeds among the wheat and explaining it. You may remember that parables are one of Jesus' favorite teaching techniques. They always have a twist. So let's listen for that twist today. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in the field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed seeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the servants of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, an enemy has done this. The servants said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, no, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then Jesus left the crowds and went into the house and his disciples approached him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. Jesus answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed are the children of the kingdom and the weeds are the children of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The son of man will send his angels and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evil doers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their creator. Let anyone with ears listen. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God within us, for the word of God among us, thanks be to God. Here on this island of concrete and glass, asphalt and steel, Jesus's agrarian illusions might be lost on us. We're city people. We live stacked on top of one another, nervously navigating the mass of mortality that buries the fields and streams, farms and forests, that once defined the landscape. We get so wrapped up in this frenzy of our day-to-day -day lives that we can sometimes lose sight of what connects us to the rest of the country, the rest of the world, and the rest of humanity. By bringing us back to nature, back to the garden, the author of Matthew invites us to step back and imagine an existence amid pastures and harvests. Some of you might have come from a place like that, whether near or far, and can easily remember summers of picking berries or chasing chickens. I spent the late summers of my childhood in rural Ohio, watching the meteors of the Perseids rain down around me as I lay on my back in the middle of my uncle's farm, surrounded by towering stalks of corn, taller than a grown man. I remember the huge hay rolls, three times as tall as I, fresh from the soybean harvest, as feed for the horses and cattle. These bucolic reminiscences are about as close as I ever got to a farming kind of life. Unless you count that one summer in seminary when my partner and I decided having a rooftop garden plot would be a fun relationship experiment. We didn't know what we were supposed to plant or how to take care of it well. Some of it grew nicely in spite of our foolishness, providing us with fresh herbs for a few weeks. Others weren't so lucky, going to seed or failing to take root in the shallow soil. Worried about the fate of one particularly fickle green bean plant that seemed to attract all the weeds, I decided I'd try to save it. I pulled up the weeds around it and carefully scooped up the roots to place it in the new soil. 
but I went to gently pat the roots into their new home. I noticed they'd been broken apart, dangling limply, shredded. See, had I been wiser, had I been remembering this biblical parable, I may have known not to try to save my poor beans before they sprouted, before they were ready to gather. The metaphor in Matthew isn't perfect though. Sometimes fields absolutely need to be weeded before the harvest in order to save the crop. But in some cases, like with my beans, the root systems become so interconnected that pulling up the weeds would also destroy the harvest, the source of livelihood, nourishment, and sustenance for the household and beyond. And what makes this passage so difficult to wrestle with is the fact that the weeds themselves aren't inherently bad because nothing in nature is. It's rather the enemy who sows the seeds of the weeds, who is the source of harm. These weeds take root and they're simply trying to survive like all living things. If they were growing where weeds usually do, along the side of the roads, in the cracks of the sidewalk, they wouldn't be a nuisance at all. They'd perhaps even add a bit of beauty to the otherwise mundane. They only ended up in the wheat fields because someone actively wanted to cause harm, thereby dooming them to their fate, to be discarded, burned in the furnace at the harvest. The context of where the weeds grow is what matters. And then on the other hand, Matthew's Jesus is practically hitting us over the head with his metaphor. As if it wasn't already obvious enough, he pedantically re-explains to his disciples, who, at least in the Gospel of Matthew, never quite seem to grasp the point he's trying to make. So, if the field is the world, the neutral ground, our very earth, and the harvest is the end of the age, the end of times, the reckoning, or, more simply, each of our own individual deaths, then what do we make of a life of weeds among wheat? Indeed, no one chooses their circumstances of birth. No one even asks to be born. We humans arrive into the world screaming, grasping, wailing, and we never really stop. We stake our claim in the vast expanse of the history of existence, ambitiously hoping to leave some sort of mark in time. And I think what Jesus is really trying to say here is that it's how we go about making that mark and what mark we really want to make that makes us either weeds or wheat. One can have all the fertile ground for becoming a force of good in the world, but squander it nonetheless. And even if we're sown from a hand that seeks to cause harm, whether implicitly or actively, we can make the choice to, reg to resist growing into something sinister. I for instance, did not choose my own white privilege. Rather, it's a byproduct of centuries of white supremacy. Nor did I choose my comfortable upper middle class, highly educated upbringing. But I can choose to acknowledge these things. And by acknowledging, acknowledging them and acknowledging them again and again as undeserved outcomes of genetics, others' hard work, and a long horrific history of exploiting other people, use their power for good, to fight for and be in solidarity with those who did not happen to be born with several legs up in the world already, on whose back my own privilege was built, at the expense of their liberation, their opportunity. Jesus shows us that even if we don't get to choose where and how we're planted, we get to choose how we grow. We don't choose the times we live in, but we can choose to do with the time that's given us. We get to choose who we want to be. The parable of the weeds among the wheat isn't just about good versus evil, God versus Satan, heaven versus hell. Jesus speaks to us on the surface in stark terms, but between the lines offers infinite nuance. Most of all, he offers us a chance to examine how we are growing, what we are growing amongst, and who we want to grow to be. If we want to follow Christ, if we want to become like the wheat and shine like the sun, we need to stare the forces of evil in the face and exercise them from our existence. We can hope, as Paul says, for what we cannot see. The possibility of a future that is still unimaginable, so radically different than anything we know. And this is precisely what hope is. It's the understanding that a just world is ever imminent, yet always out of reach. 
a mirage shimmering on the horizon. The knowledge that God's work is being done, but yet to be done. I have, in recent times, seen more hope in the midst of suffering, death, pandemic, and pain than I've experienced in my nearly three decades of life. And this hope is collective, communal, transcendental. It's the hope that breaks down barriers, that charges headlong to harm, knowing that love will always win, even if we never live to see it. It's the hope that burns away hatred and evil, that does not fear death. It's the hope that makes us mortal, what makes us truly human, and what gives us the ability to choose whether to be weeds or to be wheat. Amen.